When we talk about militarization, it's not just the uh, it's not just the the laws, the stringent extraordinary laws, and the uh, extraordinary nature of use of of force and suppression uh, to cow down people. It also has its impact on the on people's material reality. How? I mean, when security forces in such large numbers, and if you have more than 600,000 security forces, half of them are army, others central paramilitary forces, and a motley body of, of uh, I mean, uh, SOG, state police, etc., etc., armed police, uh, you require place for them to, to, to pitch their tents, where they can live, reside, where they can cook their food and rest, uh, they have recreation facilities, etc., etc., etc. You require land. It so happens that in order to deploy such a large force, nearly 10% of the land area of the Kashmir Valley uh, is in the, in the hands of uh, security forces. So if 10% of land comes under occupation of security forces, for completely wasteful, unproductive use, it also impacts. It it doesn't just impact, just not just that ten percent goes out of production, but much more happens because the very presence of the security force camps, right next to habitations of people, also impacts their daily movement, their mobility. But if you have six hundred battalions or more than six hundred battalions. Uh, present there, it means an enormous amount of land that goes out of, uh, comes under occupation. What happened to the Kashmiri Pandits was extremely sad, extremely tragic, and by no manner or means can one condone it. But the responsibility didn't just rest with the Kashmiri Muslims, I'm afraid. The responsibility also rests with the Indian state in enabling the Kashmiri Pandits to also migrate under false assurance that it's only a temporary migration for six months. Once situation is brought under control, they'll be brought back. It's 27 years now. All those false promises and assurances given, these are all recorded. These are all available in terms of letters that people who migrated from the valley wrote to Kashmiri press media in the 1990 and 91 in that period. So what I'm trying to say is that, yes, what happened to the Kashmiri Pandits is extremely tragic. But what became of that is another tragedy that is being played out on us, which is that, that the Kashmiri Pandit issue is being used to negate the democratic demands of a hugely popular movement. It's as if they're being one is being pitted against the other to say, well, since you couldn't keep Kashmiri Pandits safe, you have no right to demand right of self-determination. The only rights that we can talk about is of Kashmiri Pandits. The point is, it's not just the Kashmiri Pandits who suffered. After they were moved out, the kind of brutal suppression that was unleashed on the Kashmiri Muslims and what has continued to happen in the last 27 years cannot be wiped out. You can't pit the suffering of one to negate the suffering of the other and the continued suffering of the other. Burhan Wani, who's supposed to be an archetype terrorist, look at this terrorist who in his Facebook appeals to the Kashmiri Pandits to return, telling them that please believe that we offer you protection, we offer you security. Now, we can say that this is all propaganda. That's not the point, but the point is that it's coming from the mouth of somebody who's supposed to be a terrorist. So, what kind of a terrorist is it who is inviting Kashmiri Pandits who should be hated, whom they had only thrown out? Every movement has made mistakes. The point is whether the movement shows the capacity to make corrections. It is that which I'm pointing towards, that they show, which gives me hope. It will be too much to only blame BJP, RSS and the Indian state. Indian society also is responsible for being blind to what was happening.
You know, when I first began work in Kashmir, I met a lot cross-section of people, amongst them also Kashmiri Pandits who did not leave or migrate from Kashmir. There are just about less than 800 families of Kashmiri Pandits left in Kashmir. And it's interesting because there's a whole debate about how they were facilitated to leave, after which, you know, they'll take care of the situation that was prevailing at that time. I also heard very interesting stories about how in the early 90s, when processions just before the Kashmiri Pandits in fact left en masse out of the valley, how some of them would have the first line of protesters would always be the Kashmiri Pandits, men or women. And I was very interested and intrigued to know, and they said it's very simple because the security forces will not pull a trigger if there are pundits marching in front of us. And this is how close, and this, uh, this was the kind of relationship, I think, because they also understood, Kashmiri pundits, that this is how they are being treated, the Kashmiri Muslims. So there's a very close relationship, and the government keeps talking about this rehabilitation and bringing them back. When I went, met all many of the families in different districts in Kashmir, but when I went to the Jammu camps, it's very amazing because the people living there till today after 27 years, one very valid question they ask is, when the government wants us to come back there, why is it building more camps here in Jammu? And I happened to meet some families in Mutti camp in Jammu, of whom two of them had come when the government uh, started this uh, Pandit colony, as they call it, in Shekhupura. So I went to visit them, and you will not believe when I entered, it is firstly pretty remote out of the city, and the walls are like prison walls, and it's all barbed wire on top. And then as soon as you enter, there's a big post of the CRPF right inside that compound. And then finally, I went to visit the families. I saw how they lived. And they told me, this is not what we expected. This is not how we want to live, because we are better off in the camps then. Why should we be living in Kashmir, in Srinagar, that too, and live like this? And in Jammu also, what the Kashmiri pundits have said is that this is a game the government has been playing now for 27 years. Because the moment we are all rehabilitated in Kashmir, it means the situation is normal. Then why do you need such a big uh, force, you know, the military? Because once Kashmiri Pandits and Kashmiri Muslims are living as they used to live earlier, which it is possible, I think, then the government has to admit that, yes, today the situation is normal. Look, all the Pandits are back. And I think homelessness and leaving your home so suddenly it's not only the Kashmiri Muslims who were surprised one morning when they woke up that from their own mohalla so many Pandit families had gone. I met some of the Pandits in Kashmir who said, my neighbor, I didn't know that they had left. So how was it that people living in the same locality were not aware that the next morning the buses came or whatever happened? Many of the families left like that, but there were many others who later took whatever transport they could. Indians also need to sit up because it's always seen as a communal issue. You know, Kashmiri Muslims have driven out the minority, which is Kashmiri Hindus. And I don't think Kashmir movement or people who are out there struggling are communal or they don't like to see it as a communal problem because that kind of relationship, I think, still exists because till today some of the orchards and the homes that the Kashmiri pundits had to suddenly leave are looked after by their Muslims. And one of the Kashmiri pundit family which had returned for the first time after 15 years or something, they told me with tears in their eyes how they were greeted by the entire Muslim families that lived in that. All of them came out, there was a feast and they did everything they could, actually, and this is how they want to welcome them. I think a lot depends on the government that it has to facilitate that without creating these separate colonies with barbed wire for them.